we all have something in common here, every single one of us, and that's time. I love the little uh, clip. The little girl said, what's that? He said, "Uh, that's time lost, that little broken clock. And then that little helicopter clock, what's that? Well, that's, uh, what is it? Time flies. flies. And how many know that none of us are getting younger? Look at your neighbor and say, you're not getting any younger. (laughs) (laughs) And one of the gifts that God gave us is time. Every single one of us have 24 hours a day. Every single one of us. God has blessed us with a lifetime of of life, and he put his spirit in us, for those that know him personally, and, uh, and he gives all of us an opportunity to make the necessary changes that need to be made in our life, and the reason I started with this clip today is because next weekend is Christmas, can you believe that? And we have seven Christmas services, and this year I was just kind of thinking, okay, God, what direction do you want me to go on Christmas? And as we were, as a team, talking and thinking, I just thought to myself, I told the staff, I want to call it a timeless hope. Because how many know that the word timeless seems that, it basically means, or it's defined as this, if you look it up in the Webster's Dictionary, that um, it's, it's, it's time that cannot be affected by anything. And how many know that Jesus can be affected by anything that we go through in this time life or in this lifetime? And so we're bringing the focus back on what really matters. And just to give you guys a few quotes from some people that have lived on this earth. For example, there's a guy named uh, Leo uh, Tolstoy. He said this. He said, the two most powerful warriors are patience and time. How many can use a little bit of patience this holiday season? Help me, Jesus. I've needed some patience. This this week has been a rough week. But, uh, but, But your greatest warrior is patience and time. And when this guy said this, he's basically saying that we can only lose time by taking the defensive. And I know that it's these holiday seasons where there's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of bitterness, resentment, maybe. Maybe there's some triggers that start hitting us around this time. And without really even thinking, we can lose such a precious time like Christmas and and, and, and not experience the wonder, the miracle the love of God in this season. Um, Benjamin Franklin said this, time is money, honey. Have you ever said that? Like time is money. Come on, let's go. Time is money. This is Benjamin Franklin. And what he meant by this was a person is known by their productivity. In other words, each choice you make has a price. All of us, whatever decision we make, it has a price. It's going to cost us something And in other words, I'll say it this way. The time I kill is killing me. That's the truth. That goes for all of us. A guy named uh, Folklore, he was some, you know, leader back in the year of 1212. And he made a very, very amazing statement that we all know as well. Time waits for no one. And isn't that true? That time does not wait for you. You have no control of time. You and I, we have no power over time. Time is just going to keep going. Every single day just keeps going. And when I was kind of just reading a little bit about this guy, he's basically saying that no man has enough power to stop time or to change its course. But how many know that I may not be able to change the course of the time because the clock is going to keep ticking, tick, tock, tick, tock, but I can make the change necessary in order to have a better time in this life. How about you? Here's another one. William Shakespeare said this, better three hours too soon than a minute too late. It's better three hours too soon than a minute too late. That means that it it takes an action than miss the chance to love. It takes an action than to miss the time to forgive. It takes an action than to miss a chance to embrace someone right now. Time is so precious Benjamin Franklin said this, lost time is never found again. In other words, you can't keep today's hour for tomorrow. We all know that, but it's almost like we still tend to procrastinate with time. Can I give you one more? Jack Cornfield said this, the trouble is 
you think you have all the time. And the truth is that we don't have time. As I was this week, I was invited to speak at, um, at Eternal Valley, which is a pretty big, you know, cemetery. Um, and uh, they, they have a special Christmas service every single year for anyone that has had anyone pass on. And, it, you know, it was, it was a little bit hard for me to do that. And when I was invited, I had to think about it because I had someone that passed away, my niece, and it was kind of like bringing back mixed emotions and feelings. But, but I know I know who my hope is, and so I did it. And it was so beautiful just to see how this this eternal valley just really took the time to do something special for family. But as I was looking at every single picture on the screen, I was like, my God, I'd say 80% of them were probably under the age of 50 from every age, from child to, and it just really did something inside of me, right? But I thought to myself, I'm like, man, time is really short. Like, we don't know our time. I mean, I think if we're not careful, we can lose sight of our time just like we can lose sight of Jesus. And there's two important questions that I want to present to you today that we should ask ourselves. Number one, what really matters to you? What matters to me right now? Is it all the trees? Is it running around? Is it Cyber Monday? Is it, you know, Black Friday? You know, is it, you know, being chaos? And is it arguing with people? Is it causing division? Like, what's, what, what are you going to do with this? What matters to you? Number two, what do you know? And I want to just kind of lay a foundation here because I want you to know what Jesus knew. And every single one of us, can you put the, the title of my message, please? Everybody say this, this I know. And I know that what you're hearing me say, you're like, yeah, 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 this I know. Yeah, but there's, there's an issue here. There's a problem here. We all know a lot of information, but not many of us apply the information that we know. And one thing that Jesus knew is what I'm about to read with you. Now look at this. Jesus was on a time crunch. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 through 50 says this. It says, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. Now, the Feast of the Passover was something that was like a major holiday in Jerusalem. The Feast of the Passover, and I've been to one. I've been, it was so awesome to experience it. But a Passover basically is when the people of Israel, they, would, they, they celebrate this Passover every single year. And it basically represents the salvation, the freedom the liberation that God did for his people. And it goes anywhere from seven to eight days straight. It's just like a party. Every single day, it's just party, party, party. It's a big feast. It's something big, kind of like us right now. We are celebrating Christmas right now this month, right? And it should be a big feast, but what happens to us? Let's keep reading. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast, and when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Everybody say, they didn't know it. So there's things that we say we know, but the reality is, there's a lot of things that we don't know about. Check this out. But supposing him to have been in the company, to be in the fellowship, being in the crew of the family going back home, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days they found him. Can you imagine losing your 12-year-old kid for three days? Now, I know that when you read the Bible, you can be all spooky spiritual, like, okay, it was, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, the father of Jesus. No, they were parents, guys. I'm sure they were ticked. A 12-year-old kid lost for three days. Three days. Can you imagine just how many parents do I have in this house right now? Okay, just picture a, your 12-year-old child being lost for three days. You have no, you, you went to the family's house, you went to the, and no one's like, I haven't seen him. Three days. And in the three days he was in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Now, if I was a parent, it'd be different. <laughs> Get a spanking of your life. Praise Jesus. Okay, look, your father 
and I have sought for you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know, there's, there's that, did you not know again, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Say that with me. I must be about my father's business. Say it one more time. I must be about my father's business. Now say it like you mean it now. I must be He's like, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Jesus said, basically, did you not know that I am about the father's business? God the Father has commissioned me. He's given me some, He's given me purpose. He's given me intention. He's given me meaning to this life. He's giving me a timeline, and I am on crunch time. I have to seek every opportunity that God has given me, and I have to do something with this time. But notice in the verse that the scripture says that Mary and Joseph lost Jesus for three days. How many days did they lose Jesus for? Three days. They lost him for three days. Their son, during a celebration, during the feast, during the party, they lost. How do you lose your kid at a party? For three days. You know what I really believe? What God is trying to, listen, you got to read the scripture with understanding because I believe that there's a message in every single context of the story as you read it. God is trying to say something to us. I really believe what he's saying is don't lose Christ in your Christmas. It's so easy right now. You're planning. You're going to the store. You're trying to find the perfect gift. You're, you're going crazy. You're flipping people off at the mall because they stole your parking space. We're all going cray, cray, wild, wild, right? <laughs> but we're losing. Listen, we can lose Christ in our Christmas for three days. That means that any single person here right now, if we're not careful, if we're not focusing and losing sight of time, there's still time to leave this place today and be like, okay, I got to shake off all the, the busyness, right? I got to shake off the craziness. And I need to realize that, wait a minute, there's a reason for this season. And it's beyond all the toys under the tree. And it's beyond all the Christmas cookies. And we love all that stuff. We do that stuff here. We go crazy here. We love all that stuff. But to lose Christ, if Mary and Joseph can lose Jesus for three days, you and I can lose Jesus. Three days. It's possible to lose Christ. In other words, it's possible to know about Jesus like many of us know. We know it's Christmas. We know... You know, the, 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 the Savior was born. We know the whole Christmas story. But, but we're not talking about what you know. See, even people like the woman who came at the ADM, who claimed an, to be an atheist. I was an ex-atheist. I get it. I understand people that are far away from God, that hate religion. I understand. I get it. That's why we do ch church differently here, because I know what I didn't like. And, uh, and as we were talking, I was telling her, you know, it's not about just knowing that there's a God. But it's being in relationship with God. It's being in fellowship with God. See, all of us here can be sitting and we're like, well, yeah, of course. We know we're supposed to go to church on Sundays. You know, we know we're supposed to be around, you know, family. And, and, and we know that under the tree is our presence. And we know that the greatest gift is Jesus. But how many know that knowing is not enough? Intimacy and fellowship with Jesus is what we need more than ever right now. That, is, that should be like the first priority. And there's no amount of time in this world for anything that can take away my precious time, especially from the one who gives us the time. How many know that God is the time giver? He is the gift giver of time. Look at John chapter 10, verse 27 and 20. It says this. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. Who listens to, who listens to his voice? Any sheep in the house today? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but, but check this out. He says, my sheep. He says, the people that know me intimately, they know my voice. You don't have to hear an audible voice. You can open your Bible and God is always talking. God is still speaking. He says, he says my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. When we know him, we do what? We follow him. And it says, I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. And here's my, I love this part. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
That's powerful right there. Like right now, you can be going through the most hellish time. You can be going through the most difficult time, the most uh, biggest trial of your life. But God says that when you know me and I know you, when you follow me, there is no devil in hell. There is no enemy. There is no person that can snatch you out of my hand. That, that right there should bring you joy right there. Man, we should just bring the worship team back up here and sing joy to the world, right? No, he's like, no one can snatch you from my presence. No one can snatch you from my hand. I protect you. And if you're here sitting here today, maybe you don't have eternal, maybe you have eternal insecurity. Well, guess what? You can be secure today. That when you follow Christ, when, when you know him personally, man, he holds you. He protects you. He leads you. He guides you. But you have to be in intimacy with him, right? We got to know him. We can't lose Christ in Christmas. Nothing can pluck you out of his hand. I love this. However, what can pluck you out of his hand? Because I've heard people say this, oh, God has left me. It's like, no, God never left you. You left God. Have you ever heard a Christian say like, I don't know where God is. God has just left me. He just forgot all about me. No, 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 no. You, you pried his little fingers open, and you're like, I choose me. That's what happens. See, the devil can't snatch you out of his hand, but you can take yourself out of his hand. You can remove yourself out of his hand of blessing, his hand of favor, his hand of healing, his hand of, of, of love, his hand of grace and mercy. Satan can't do that. We can choose to do that. And if it's possible for Mary and Joseph to lose Jesus for three days, then that means it's possible for us to lose Christ as well. If you look all throughout the scriptures from Old Testament to New Testament, there are different men of God, women of God, people that were following God, people that were obeying God, that literally left God for a season. Let's just take, for example, remember Noah? Huh? When Noah knew where he was? That Noah was just so consumed with himself. He was angry. He was mad at God. And you know what happened with Noah? Noah lost his relationship with God for a season, but later he came back. Let's take David. David, David, a man after God's own heart. How, how are you a man after God's own heart and then Lose your relationship with God. But it happened to David as well. For a season, he left this relationship with God. We take Samson. Samson, the strongest man on planet Earth. Man was given purpose, was given meaning to life, was given an assignment, was given everything. Man, the strongest man on Earth. And even he lost that fellowship, that intimacy with God. Let's go New Testament now. You guys remember Simon Peter? Remember when Jesus, you know, um, comes and sits with Peter after the resurrection? We knew that Peter denied Jesus. How many times? How many days did Mary and Joseph lose Jesus for? How many days was Jesus in the tomb? Something about losing. Something about that three. Three is the number of Trinity. Three is the number of unity. Three is the number of community. And so Peter denied. He lost his relationship. He lost his intimacy with Jesus. And you know how we know that? Because Jesus comes to him and he says to him, Hey, Peter, do you love me? And what did Peter say? Yes, Lord, I do love you. He had regret because of time. He came back to him again and says, Peter, do you love me? And of course, the first time he said, yes, I love you. He said, okay, feed my sheep. The second time, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, I love you, Lord. Tend to my sheep. And then he comes the third time, Peter, do you love me? Three times. And he says, yes, I love you. Only you know. He said, only you know. Only you know whether or not I love you. And he said, okay. He says, then feed my sheep. Think about this. Any of us can 
lose Christ in our Christmas. But Jesus comes back to us, the church, and he says, but do you love me? Because though you may have lost me, you can get me back. You can invite me back. You can welcome me back. You can put your life back in my hand, and then you watch and see what I will do. Listen, here's the scary part. We too can lose it. Look at, let me show you scripturally. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says this. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he. In other words, if you think like, no, I'm good, I'm good. He ain't talking to me, pastor. You tell him. You tell the church. Yeah. You tell my spouse. They're sitting right next to me. You let them know. No, no. This is for all of us. It says take heed lest anyone, any of us are vulnerable to fall away from God. Any of us are vulnerable to lose that. Christ in our Christmas and I'm not wanting to come to next weekend when we have our seven Christmas services and to do the typical same thing where we sing Christmas songs and we do we do a lot of cool stuff here man we have like and don't miss the next Sunday we have a crazy production probably the best production we've ever done in nine years and we've done some pretty amazing stuff here with some great creativity but next weekend wild but I don't want to be here singing Christmas songs, seeing cool productions, and, and lighting up candles, hopefully not burning this place down, because this year we're going real, with real candles help us, and a lot of uh, fire extinguishers. But we want to make sure that, man, we create an experience. But, but what good does it do to have a, a, a Christmas experience with no Christ in it? I want Jesus in this house. I want him to heal people in this house. I want Jesus to touch people in this house. I want Jesus to grab a hold of people and embrace them and tell them that you're not too far that I can't reach you. You're not too far that I can't rescue you. You're not too far that I can't help you. I want people to be able to come in here and say, whoa, your creativity is cool, but let me tell you what's even cooler. Man, is that I met the real Jesus. That's what we want in this house. That's the greatest gift, amen? But, if I don't make room for him in this season, come on, if I don't make time for God in this season, if we don't allow ourselves to fellowship and be in intimacy with him in this season, we lose it. And you don't want January to come around and be like, don't be that person that says, like, dang, Christmas didn't feel like Christmas. Listen, the only reason it didn't feel like Christmas is because you took Christ out of Christmas. There's no other reason. This Christmas, we need to make it about the reason for the season, salvation. It's about salvation. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 7. It says, and she, now this is the story of Christmas now, okay? Just, I'll give you a little taste, a little teaser. And, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in, in swaddling clothes. Now, I want you to understand this. This is pretty wild how here we have Jesus who's called the king of what? Kings. I mean, he's, he's royalty, like, how does God the Father send his royalty? How does he send Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords? Like, if you got titles like that, I mean, you're like celebrity status, right? I mean, you must, you must got some fame. You, got, you must have some monies. And we know that because the Bible says that heaven, the streets, they're made of gold, walls of jasper. So heaven is it's wealthy. It's rich. It's amazing. It's, it's got colors that would probably blow our hair back and if you don't have any you'd probably grow some hair it's so amazing like that i'm telling it's a but but here's the truth but listen listen but here we have a god that's so down to earth literally he's so down to earth that he comes to your level he comes to my level he didn't have nice clothes man they just had some rags that they found in the barn i mean he's he was born in a feeding trough it's where the animals ate. That's how, see, that's how much God, that, so someone says, well, God doesn't understand. Man, he, un, tr trust me, he understands the person who has no home that's living on the street, sleeping on the street. That's how down on earth God is. Amen. And he says, and so she wrapped him with, with, with uh, swaddling cloths and, and laid him in a manger because, why? Because, why? Because there was no room for them because now listen you can be dressed nice here today come on all the bills are paid you got all the christmas gifts under the tree and you got the nice big old seven foot 
five, eight foot, nine foot, ten foot tree at the house, and you got the nice baked honey ham in your home and the turkey and all the trimmings and all those things. But let me tell you something. What good does it do you to have all those things, but you made no room for Jesus? You have all those things, you know, and I, I, got, I got everything covered, but, but there's no room for Jesus. And how many believe that, that innkeeper that said, there ain't no room for you, that motel, I bet that dude regrets the day that he said no to Jesus. He could have been the four seasons of that time. I don't know, man. Things could have been like, yeah, hey, this is where Jesus was born. I mean, this dude probably regretted it. He probably thought like, what was I thinking? Oh, my God, if I only I would have just let them, you know, have a room. But they, they made no room for him. Don't let the celebration of his birth steal time from you this Christmas. This is the time where we celebrate and we're not losing Jesus. We're not going to have all these parties and all this fun and, and lose that moment of intimacy with God. It's so powerful. When you read the scriptures, I'm telling you, there's something about scriptures, like I was saying earlier, because every story has a reason. For example, when I was a young kid, when I was little, I remember telling my mom, we'd be in the car, and I was, I don't know, I was young, probably six, seven years old. I'd be like, Mom, where did I come from? And where was I born? And my mom was like, well, you were born here in Hollywood, California. I'm like, really? Okay. I'm like, but where? And I remember driving down Sunset. Do you guys know where Sunset Avenue is, right? And then she's like, see that hospital? I was born in Kaiser Hospital, right? And I'm like, whoa, that's so cool. And we asked, you know, a lot of goofy questions. I don't know about what, what you've asked, but I, I've asked a lot of questions. I was like, yeah, so, you know, you know, for some of us, was I an ugly baby? Was I, was I a cute baby? Did the doctor come on and say, like, well, here's your beautiful, good-looking child? Or was it like, oh, here, <laughs> you know, like what kind of what kind of baby was I? You know, how much did I weigh? You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, to this day, I still have. what well, I used to call my bija, my bija. Uh, my mom used to say, or my dad used to say, no, it's your bija. You know, bija means your woman, but bija was like my cover, and I still have my little cover from when I was born. And uh, so I would ask a lot of questions. But think about this, okay? Now let's bring it down to earth. Don't you think Jesus probably asked? His mother, Mary, his father, Joseph. Hey, where did I come from? Where was I born? Where am I from? What city was I born in? Hey, how much did I weigh? Not realizing that, listen, I'm sure you heard all the stories of how, how they had to run for their life on how certain family members turned their back on them in that season about people that were talking about Mary, who was a virgin, <laughs> yet was pregnant. Think about the slander, the gossip that they were experiencing. I'm sure that they shared with Jesus, like, man, we were running for our life just to give birth to you. And I don't know what you're trying to birth right now, what, what you're trying to birth out of your life, what vision, what dream, but there's been constant attack. There's been all kinds of stuff just coming against you. But let me tell you something. This is the season of the greatest hope that we can receive today. And so I say this because think about this. One of the major things, I grew up in poverty, and so I remember I'd be sitting at the table with my siblings, and I would tell my sisters, I'd be like, you know what? And we would go sometimes days without food, not because we had horrible mom. My mom was divorced, but it's just that my mom was poor, working three jobs, and just couldn't. But, man, I'd sit at the table, and I'm like, when I grow up, my refrigerator is going to be packed, and I'm going to have sodas on the first level, and then the second level, orange juice, and I'm going to have steak in the, in the, and I would just, like, start to, Finding everything. But isn't it amazing that there are certain things that trigger us in our childhood now as adults? Like, there's a reason we're weird today, right? For example, like, if I'm eating, like, let's just say, like, an awesome order of Cajun-style fries, and you ask me, can I have one? i be like, no. <laughs> Why? There's something inside of me that I already knew that I didn't have, and I made a promise when I was a kid that I will never ever lack food and let me tell you something when I was old enough my refrigerator has never lacked food ever because it was a it was like my commission it was my mission but but don't worry what I do and I and I still tell my family my wife my kids you want some fries let me go buy you some I'll be right back and my, but you ain't touching mine do I have any weirdos like that out there like you just don't let people touch your stuff. Oh, especially don't drink out of my drink. That's nasty. You know what I'm saying? But, but we all, but th listen, there's a reason I share this. Jesus had to have heard the story when mom and dad had to say to him, 
there was a moment, Jesus, there was a moment, son, where nobody would make room for you. And I say this because later on we see, which I'm going to share with you right now, we're almost done, that Jesus says, like I said, like many of you said, that will never, ever happen to me again like that. I'll never be in poverty, maybe some of you. Maybe some of you said, you know, I'll never allow this to happen. I'll never, and you've, you've all said things and you've kept your word to them. Some of you, maybe you've broken your word, but you can get it back again. And so Jesus, I'm sure, heard the story of him not having room for himself. And so look at this. He looks at his disciples, and I can see how Jesus was saying something's going to change here. Maybe there's maybe something I couldn't have when I was a young child, but I'm going to make sure that for the rest of my life something's going to change. Look at chapter, uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 16 through 23. Are you guys here? Yes. Awesome. Look. It says, Jesus replied this parable. There was a man who invited many to join him in a great feast. A great what? So he's talking about party again. And when the day for the feast arrived, and when Christmas arrives, the host, the who? Instructed his servants to notify all the invited guests and to tell them to come. Who's your host at Elevate Church? Thank you. I'm sorry, let's, who's your host at Elevate Church? I am, right? I'm your host. We host you. We host you, right? So Jesus is saying, I'm your host. He's telling his disciples, I'm your host and I'm instructing you. Listen to this. He says, notify all the invited guests and tell them to come for everything is now ready for you. But one by one, they all made what? Excuse. Like so many of us have made excuses. Look at this. One said, I can't, I, I can't come. I just bought some property. And I'm, about, obli- I'm, not about, I'm obligated to go and look it over. Another said, please accept my regrets. Come on, regrets. <laughs> For I have purchased five ox, and I need to make sure that they can pull the plow. So that's a weird excuse. Here's the, it, it gets worse. Here's a, here's, a, here's a real bad one. Another one said, uh, I can't come because I just got married, and she don't like to go to church, uh, or he doesn't like to go to church, and so, yeah, we're staying in today. Verse 21, the servant reported back to the host and told him of all their excuses, so the master became angry and said to his servant, go out once throughout the city and invite anyone you find. Invite who? Anyone you find. And I get this. Listen, I know that many times we don't like to look at God as a God who gets upset. But let me tell you something. God is a God of feelings as well. Like God never stops loving you. God never stops believing in you. God never stops rescuing you. But obviously in the story, Jesus is giving the disciples an analogy, an illustration of what it means to him for people to come. Because he has prepared everything for them. Let's keep reading. Look at this. So the master became angry and he said to the servant, go throughout the city and invite anyone you find, the poor, the blind, the disabled, the hurting, and the lonely, and invite them to my banquet. How many know any hurting people? How many know any lonely people? How many know any sick people, right? Whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. There's all kinds of hurting people around us. So there is no excuse on why we should ever stop coming to God's banquet. But definitely there's no excuse why we shouldn't be inviting other people to come experience the same healing that we receive. And look at this. And when the servant returned to his master, he said, Sir, I have done what you've asked, but there's still room. There's still what? Room. That was Jesus' focus. I want to make room. He says, but there's still room for more. So the master told him, all right, then go out again. (laughs) And this time, bring them all back with you. Now I get it. Here at LV Church, we're so good at, like, marketing. You know, we're on the radio. We're on Instagram, Facebook. You know, we've been on television. As a matter of fact, KCAL Channel 9 News will be here tonight. They're going to be interviewing. I'll be one of the people that will be interviewing. They want to do the whole coverage. I like that. That's so cool. I like our little videos that go up. That's, but let me tell you something. But that should be the given of what we do as marketing. But let me tell you what our job is, our responsibility is. Our responsibility is to go out and invite, go out and bring, go out again and again and again 
And in this story, Jesus is saying, okay, you've already done the little invitation cards, kind of like the Christmas cards we gave you, but it's not just about passing out cards like, hey, come check out this church service. No, it's about God saying to us, no, then you bring them with you. Are you listening? And he says, uh, he says again, and this time, bring them all back with you. Persuade the beggars on the streets, the outcasts, even the homeless, urgently assist that they come in and enjoy the feast so that my house will be What does that mean when we think so that my house may be full? Let me tell you something. Every single chair that you are sitting on right now or the empty one has a story of someone. Do you think that God just wants a big church? No, God wants souls. God wants people that are far away, people that are hurting. People like that young man on Christmas who was sitting in one of these chairs. I don't know which chair he was sitting in. But every chair reflects someone's story. It reflects someone's decision. Someone who may have been in a place where they were in distraught, but somehow found hope in a service, whether it was through worship, a guest speaker, whether it's myself, my wife. Someone was touched. Every single chair reflects a family that was restored, a marriage that was healed, a child that was far away that came back, the prodigal sons and daughters who wanted nothing to do with God, but it was a chair in a service like this where heaven touched them. There have been people that have sat in this chair that were given six months to live, and by the grace and the power of God, God has healed them, restored them. There have been people that are sitting in these chairs that came to know Christ and whether it was the same day or months or a year later went home to be with the Lord. Every single chair represents a life that God wants to change. It's not let's fill this house so that we can be a big church. Listen, the Bible says that he adds to the church daily. Those who labor, labor in vain. But unless the Lord builds, everything we do is useless. See, this is the season where you and I have to come to the place and realize if it matters for God, for his house to be full, if it matters to God for lives to be changed, then it should matter to me so much that I'm going to do anything to reach my coworkers, my family members, anyone from that matter. I gave the 8 a.m. A, uh, a little challenge. I said, you know, what if we all this week, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to film it too. We get into an Uber, a Lyft, and, and we just start inviting anyone. And we just, we just tell, listen, how many believe that, that when God touched you, like you were really forever changed? Like maybe, maybe your current condition hasn't forever been changed yet, but let me tell you something, your eternal address has been forever changed your salvation and for us to go out of our way and tell people hey listen God loves you I think the reason that most people don't share their faith is because they think that they're not good enough or you have shame in your own life or maybe you're not living right and you're like well why would I want to invite anybody if I can't even get my life right God's not looking for perfect God's just looking for someone that understands the grace and the mercy that he's given you and I and that we would share that same grace with someone else. I encourage you to do that. Whether it's an Uber or Lyft, maybe it's Starbucks today. Find your, your favorite, you know, what's that coffee shop around that everybody likes? I hate that coffee. Sorry, don't like it. I won't say it. <laughs> Wife's protecting me, don't say it. But listen, Christmas is about Jesus. And it's possible to become so distracted in this time that we forget the feast of salvation. There was no room for me, that's what Jesus said, but I make room for all now. God is making room for people. This is an illustration that he's giving. He's saying, come on, bring people, encourage people, stop making excuses, stop Stop giving reasons why, well, you know, I don't want to ask them because I don't, want to, I don't want to offend their belief. Let me tell you something. If you don't value your own belief, that's sad because the world values more what they believe than most Christians do. Sometimes I ask myself, I wonder if the Christians even believe what they believe. 
So to say that I don't want to offend someone's belief, that's already offensive. We have to have the heart that says, I'm here to change lives while I'm here on this earth. Jesus said it again. Look, he said, go at once throughout the city and invite anyone you find, the poor, the blind, the disabled, the hurting, the lonely, and invite them to my banquet. Jesus wants every chair filled. But it's not because the church keeps doing a good job at marketing. We do a good job at marketing here. We do. But I don't want to be known for the church that has a staff that does all the work by marketing. I want to be known as the church in heaven. I want heaven to look down at church and say, well, that's a people that go out of their way and they really reach people. They really care about people. It's not the pastor or the leadership always, you know, leading people to Christ. I led the lady to Christ after service, one-on-one. She didn't lift her hand in service, which is cool. But it's not about the people that come to Christ on my platform here that God has given me. It's about who am I winning to Christ outside these four walls as well? Who am I bringing to church? Especially like holidays like Easter and Christmas where people are more vulnerable to come. This is our opportunity. Can I get an amen on that? Yes. Okay. Think about this. This is quick. Um, Luke 15, 10 says this. Count on it. Look at this. Because Jesus is saying, I want to party this, this coming Sunday and, and next, next uh, Tuesday for, for our candlelight services. He says, count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. Do you realize that every time that someone comes to Christ, heaven throws a big party? That's what we want to do this coming weekend, amen? Four services, man. We want to throw Jesus the biggest party ever, and we're going to do it. But there's four S's of using your time wisely this Christmas that you're going to need. Ready? Number one, everybody say, I need the, the S of sharing. Okay, come on, we've got to be the best sharers. You can't just, you can't hoard the fact that God saved you and just be like, okay, I'm going to go to heaven, and that's it. I got myself. No, hoarder. Spiritual hoarder. No. No, 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 no. We tell everybody about Jesus. We got a sharing. Proverbs 11.30 says this. But a life lived loving God bears lasting fruit. For the one who is truly wise wins souls. You want to bear fruit in your life? You got to share. The second S you need in your life is serving. Remember, what do we say here? If you don't serve, you? Come on. If you don't serve, you swerve. We are called to be serving we want to serve people here's what mark 10 45 says it says for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many the third s is sowing ever say sowing let me listen the greatest investment in this life is what i what i what i pour into someone else i want to be able to sow life into somebody i want to sow encouragement i want to sow a prayer i want to sow hope to someone that is hopeless In Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, you can't say you treasure people, but you never win people. There's no such thing. It's not be kind to people. No, it's be kind and win people to Christ. The last S is, everybody say, seeking. Luke 19, 10 says this, the Son of Man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. This is what it's about. Luke 19, 13 says, occupy until I return. Man, we got to get to work. Close your Bibles, we're done. You got to occupy. We got to get busy. We got one week. We have people that, that you know, people that I know. They're, they're, there's, there's people that are in restaurants today, at coffee shops. There's people everywhere that, that need to experience the love of Jesus. So next Sunday, we're going to bring some people. And we're going to see their soul come to Christ. And heaven is going to throw the biggest party. You want to give, you want to give God a gift this Christmas? Bring someone. You start by bringing you, and you bring someone with you. That's the only gift that you and I can give to God. It's the greatest gift. Would you bow your head, close your eyes, please?
Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you as we leave this place today, Father. We're asking you to give us the courage, the boldness. Lord, help us not to be afraid of sharing our faith, of seeking out people, Father. People want help. People want to know you. People are waiting for every single one of us to go out of our way and to reach and to help. Lord, I pray that you would begin to put in our hearts the people that we're going to invite next Sunday, Father, that we're going to bring to your house where you will touch them. Time is running out. Lord, help us to be urgent. Help us, Father God, to have compassion for people, to have grace and mercy for people. Lord, even allow us to have the courage to invite maybe some family members we don't like, family members we don't get along with. They need you. You love them too. And so Lord, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, that we will be bringers. We will be the kind of people that will never forget the time we were broken, the time we were hurting, the time we were lost, the time we were completely at the lowest point of our life, yet you loved us, you healed us, you, you picked us up, you believed in us, you you poured out your spirit in us, God. Let us not be so consumed and distracted with life that we forget that there are souls that need saving.